So the next talk is going to be uh, Dr. Faisal Latif, um, who has been very actively involved and actually he has been the one who has been uh, basically um, running this uh, quality in the cath lab program he has done in the Middle East as well and uh, I requested him and he agreed to uh, basically do this for in the Pakistan live as well. Uh, so, so that's why he has several talks uh, today in this uh, um, session today. Uh, he is Associate Professor of Cardiology at University of Oklahoma and Director Cath Lab at uh, VA uh, Medical Center in Oklahoma. Uh, Dr. Latif, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Dr. Bashir. Can, uh, can you click the facility. slideshow? If you can, okay, yeah, now it is slideshow. Go ahead, that's fine. Now it's slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, and uh, thank you very much. You know, it, it's a, it's an honor to participate in the organization and participate in the talks this morning for the Sky Quality session. I have been serving as the chair of the Sky Quality Committee for the last uh, three years. Um, these are my disclosures. So uh, the task given to me in this talk is to talk about the National Cardiovascular Database Registry, which is NCDR. M many of you may be familiar with what NCDR is, but I'm going to go uh, uh, provide an overview. And then I'm going to provide a couple of examples how collecting data in such a registry format uh, helps quality, not only at one hospital, but hopefully at a national level. So registry programs are where continuous data is collected. This is different from a randomized control trial where you have to, where you enroll patients only who meet certain criteria, they're part of the trials. But in registry programs, you enroll 100% of the patients so that you are seeing what you are actually doing and how the patient's uh, outcomes are from the procedures that are being performed in the cath lab. Once that data is collected, that can be used for quality assessment and hopefully for quality improvement as well as research. Uh, you, these days, you would be seeing a lot of publications that come out of these registry data um, and are very helpful in uh, enhancing patient outcomes uh, from procedures. So to this effect, the NCDR was initiated by American College of Cardiology about 25 years ago. CATH PCI registry, which I'm talking about, was the first registry to start in 1998. Up until 2016, there were more than 90 million clinical records. This is a very tedious kind of process, but it is very rewarding. There are about 10 uh, um, uh, pages of uh, uh, forms that need to be filled out by data abstractors, which includes patients' demographics, details of the procedures, and so on and so forth. You will see uh, this map shows that the penetration of CATH PCI registry is almost universal. More than 90% of the uh, PCI program is, uh, in the United States are enrolled in this. So the data you get out of this registry is very wholesome and provides the actual uh, on the ground situation uh, for procedures. Uh, and as time goes by, actually these uh, forms, the data collection forms uh, are updated. Um, you know, the last update for CAF PCI registry was just about two or three years ago, and there are still updates going on because sometimes certain data points become redundant and can be removed from the data collection uh, uh, form because these forms are tedious as they are. Now, in addition to CAF PCI registry, there are many other registries uh, that are uh, talked about uh, uh, that are available, such as the transcatheter valve therapeutic registry, the peripheral vascular registry, which has now been uh, uh, merged with the uh, Society of Vascular Surgeries registry. The pinnacle registry is outpatient clinical data registry to guide uh, uh, outcomes in the outpatient setting, and so on and so forth. So how has a CATH PCI registry helped improve quality? So this is, uh, this is a paper uh, that was published a few years ago in, in JAMA that uh, was related to the appropriateness of percutaneous coronary intervention. Some of you may be familiar with the appropriate use criteria. The appropriate use criteria for PCI are three types, appropriate, uh, maybe appropriate, and uh, rarely appropriate or inappropriate. So the, the purpose of this paper was that 
when do you put in a stent? Is it, it is sufficient to just see a 70% stenosis in a coronary artery and go ahead and put a stent in? Well, probably not. That would not pass the appropriateness criteria. The appropriateness criteria would include how many vessels are diseased? Is the patient symptomatic? Is there a functional assessment? Do we have a stress test that is abnormal? If the stress test was abnormal, is it high risk, intermediate risk? And if and, uh, if a stress test is not available, or uh, then whether, whether an IFR and an FFR was performed, and that uh, it, it puts the patient in a category where appropriateness um, would come into play. Patients who are admitted with acute coronary syndromes are probably going to be appropriate uh, category almost 100% of the time. So this paper uh, 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 looked at uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of PCIs across the United States. And uh, as you can see in this graph, uh, that about 10% of the hospitals uh, were in the category of inappropriate PCIs, non-acute PCIs. Of course, these are patients with uh, stable angina or stable ischemic heart disease, positive stress test, uh, that kind of patient, not the patients with non-ST elevation MR or unstable angina. So the highest percentage was 10%, but there were some hospitals that uh, with approximately half of the PCIs might be in the category of inappropriate PCI. So this uh, paper helped a, a study that over a period of five years, the inappropriate PCIs across the nation decreased from about 21,000 to 8,000. So this is how data collection helps that people start documenting well, people start testing more appropriately so patients can benefit uh, more from the procedure that they are having and they are not having a procedure just for the sake of uh, a 70% stenosis. Um, uh, based on based on the data collected, uh, national quality campaigns can be initiated. Uh, the CATH PCI registry showed that uh, the 50th percentile of hospitals um, uh, had a 2.8% risk of in-hospital uh, risk standardized uh, bleeding. But this was very variable uh, that, you know, 10th percentile is about 5% risk of bleeding, 90th percentile is about 1.7% uh, bleeding. So the data can be used that what strategies are being used to decrease the uh, bleeding outcomes of uh, patients. So we uh, were involved in a, in a, uh, in a uh, bleeding reduction uh, project uh, in which many uh, national sites uh, participated. Uh, the, uh, what drove us to look into that was that the proportion of patients requiring blood transfusion after PCI was about 1.86%. That's pretty high. And the uh, PCI in hospital standardized bleeding uh, risk was about 4.29%, uh, which if you look at is about 10th percentile. So only 10% uh, of hospitals were below uh, us, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, our hospital. So we started using this uh, uh, point of care tool to assess the bleeding risk, which is available online. This is a CATH PCI registry bleeding risk model. And that tells you which, what is the pre-procedural bleeding risk of the patient. If the patient's risk is high, such as, you know, there is a 10% chance of bleeding, you can use certain parameters or certain uh, strategies to reduce the risk of bleeding, such as use of bivalrudin. We have seen many randomized control trials that have shown that bivalrudin use does reduce the risk of bleeding, particularly in femoral access. Radial access does reduce the risk of bleeding, and there is some data that closure devices might improve the risk of bleeding in femoral access procedures as well. If the patients are low risk, then you don't have to necessarily use these uh, measures, even though still these measures may be useful. But if the patient is at high risk, then uh, using at least two of these uh, three strategies, such as use of um, bivalrudin, radial access, and closure devices would help improve outcomes. So this campaign uh, basically was to uh, uh, provide evidence-based practices to reduce the risk of bleeding. These were the centers that participated across the nation. There were 173 uh, PCI sites, and actually Karachi was one of them. And uh, um, 
uh, the anticoagulant utilization uh, uh, wa uh, was, of course, use of bivalrudin and uh, access site utilization. And you can see over the years, the use of radial access has increased uh, in the United States and across, of course, across the world with all the data that's available. And then this, this uh, calculator that I have already shown was used to evaluate the risk of uh, 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 bleeding in these patients a priori, uh, uh, the procedure. And then there is another uh, uh, example of how uh, collaboration with FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration, which is charged with approving devices that are used in the cath lab. So uh, this is a study that uh, was done on the femoral closure devices. Uh, uh, so as you know, perclose, angioseal, vasoseal uh, have been used over the years. So vasoseal in this study was shown to have a significantly increased uh, risk of uh, local vascular complications, uh, and some of these patients required uh, surgery. So therefore, Vasoseal was withdrawn from the market and has not been available for many years. Uh, how else uh, this, uh, the uh, registry helps? Actually, every physician, every interventional cardiologist or uh, non-invasive cardiologist, they get their cath lab data. They, uh, they get the data, how many patients are being discharged on guideline-directed medical therapy after PCI? Are the patients being discharged on aspirin, statin, uh, the second antiplatelet, the clopidogrel, uh, Brillinta, uh, Tachagrelor, uh, and so on. So it gives you an idea of how you are doing even beyond the cath lab to improve the outcomes of your patients. Basil, you have one minute left. Sure. Uh, the last aspect that I'm going to uh, talk about is the how to use this data in the privileging and credentialing. Now, this is tricky. This, it is not easy to use this data because the various hospitals have different uh, uh, level of acuity and different case mix that they are getting. Some hospitals may be getting more sick uh, patients, such as those with cardiogenic shock, with complicated STEMIs, and so on. So therefore, you cannot compare directly what that one hospital X is doing better than a hospital Y. And also, same for the physicians, because the physicians may be getting a different case mix. Some people who are doing, like Dr. Uh, Tanvir Rab had alluded to, that when you're a cath lab director or when you're a senior cardiologist, sometimes you're involved in more complex cases. So you are more, uh, uh, you face this uh, 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 imbalance of having a relatively high risk of complications. But again, use all the strategies you can to minimize it. Uh, uh, those complications. And then uh, electronic health records are not standardized. You know, some records capture more data and some less data. So uh, I'm going to finish with this quote that uh, uh, science tells us what we can do. Guidelines tell us what we should do. Registries tell us what we are actually doing. So I congratulate uh, 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 you guys to be using NCDR in Pakistan now. Hopefully more and more hospitals can participate and this would improve outcomes of patients across the board. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vessel. Um, excellent talk. And uh, I can uh, tell you actually what's been uh, happening in Pakistan. Um, I'm happy to report that actually the, the first ever center, international center that participated in NCDR was actually Tabahat Institute. And it took me like literally five years to get um, into that system. Uh, so we were able to enroll that like it was five, six years ago and we have been submitting data to NCDR. And based on the NCDR, because there was a lot of uh, issue at that time in terms of um, annual um, fee and payment, so we came up with our own registry. It's called Cardiac Registry of Pakistan CATH PCI Registry. And um, again, we developed this online database system uh, about, I would say, 10 years ago. And we started at Taba Heart Institute, where I am practicing. And then now it has been like made mandatory all over Pakistan. And currently, actually over 130 cath labs are putting data online in that registry. And uh, we have a robust database now, actually. I'm supposed to be presenting fifth annual report of uh, our uh, cardiac registry of Pakistan today and I have presented four in the past and uh, hopefully we, it's, it's going to take time but there are several challenges still there uh, but luckily we have been able to implement that registry in Pakistan and currently there are like three centers who are still putting the data in NCDR also um, because we had talked to ACC and we are able to decrease the 
overall uh, fee for entering the data and luckily we have been able to do that uh, for last few years. So NCDR really has helped us a lot to improve the quality. We get a quarterly report uh, for individual physicians and overall institute where we stand. So I have encouraged everyone uh, to do NCDR, if not NCDR, at least the cardiac registry of Pakistan. And we are planning to have that same kind of reports and hopefully help us to improve the quality of care in, in Pakistan as well. So we have a few minutes for comments and questions. I have a few panelists over there. I would like to ask them if they have any comments or questions uh, so far uh, from the talks. Yes, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Bashir. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, all the presenters uh, talk, who's, uh, including Dr. Rob, for which I have one question and a suge suggestions. Another comment on the NCDR, especially being myself as a part of that, uh, uh, the study you mentioned with the Paul Chen and John Spertus, I was in that group when this inappropriate and appropriateness criteria was made. So as uh, Bashir mentioned here, that we have started the crop registry. So my experience with the NCDR entry into that, the main issue we encountered at the time was the data was being entered not by the physicians, it was being entered by the cath lab staff, which led to a lot of inaccuracy of the data at that time. And uh, now what we're trying to do here in Pakistan is that the, these data are being entered, at least I know that, are almost being entered most of the places by the physicians or at least by the fellows. So we hope that, that we will have a better uh, data with the lesser controversies and the more inter information. And I hope in the future, myself being and having experience from my group uh, in the past, we will be able to get some further uh, information or further uh, uh, lesson from that. So that's for the NCDR, and uh, from the Dr. Rob's talk, I, will, I really, really love this part when you said that, yes, the medical director is the in charge of the cath lab, but in reality is the nursing manager, and uh, certainly that is the, I think uh, in Pakistan probably, uh, I'm sure Bashir agree with me that we are lacking that part still. Um, we should be moving forward to that because they are the people who are there all the time and uh, the outcomes of all the cath lab, all the cases and the success of the cath lab depends a lot on the nursing staff and especially the, the nursing manager and we hope with the time we will be uh, putting a more effort into that. That's what I will say. Definitely. Any other comments, uh, yeah. Dr. Yeah, uh, what, what challenges we have, I always, uh, so I'm representing Peshawar Institute of Cardiology, and the challenging in our part of the, the earth is that, that we need to educate, educate, because our transfer to the hospital for primary PCI took longer, so starting from the public education, coming to the GP's education, and then all these, so, uh, we have a structure, we have uh, a process domain and outcome, but unfortunately uh, the problem is with education. We need a lot of education in, st in terms of quality, process and outcome. And one word about patient satisfaction. So we never look at it to take the feedback from the patient. So that's one thing we should work on. Yes, definitely. I think this is part of that's why we are having this uh, session today to basically educate ourselves and everyone and to learn from the experienced uh, people from there. So I think we are going to go ahead and move, uh, uh, we are running a little bit behind. So our next talk is again going to be do by Dr. Tanmir Rab uh, on approach to the chronic uh, kidney disease patient. Uh, Dr. Tanmir, please go ahead. Thank you again. Uh, so I'm going to go to this topic about approach to the chronic kidney disease patient. I have no disclosures. So there are two different, uh, uh, you know, phenotypes in chronic kidney disease. One patients who present with acute coronary syndromes, and uh, and in four different uh, publications involving thousands of patients, it appears that uh, in chronic kidney disease, the the the, uh, the incidence of uh, acute coronary syndrome occurred in 30 percent of the cases. However, if you look at that, that uh, uh, that the invasive procedures in these patients are generally lacking and. And uh, most of the patient chronic kidney disease, it appears through, through, through data that, uh, that they do not get invasive procedures versus their non-chronic kidney disease cohorts in the community. Now, it has been shown that uh, if you look at uh, a study by Shaw published uh, some years ago, that uh, 
as your GFR decreases, as your kidney failure worsens, in the dark gray bar, is, you can see that inpatient angiograms are not performed in this group of patients, maybe because of the fear of morbidity and mortality and high procedural outcomes versus in patients who do not have chronic kidney disease. And a, rise, and a, a lower GFR, it appears that patients and physician, physicians are avoiding doing procedure in them. However, if you look for the benefit, patients with the lowest GFR, EGFR of less than 30, appear to have better benefit with PCI versus optimal medical uh, therapy with an adjusted odds ratio of 0 0.80. In contrast, in contrast, patients with stable CKD, okay, patients with stable CKD, um, you know, and still, again, uh, they still get less invasive procedure and uh, versus other groups, versus patients with uh, non-CKD who are stable who get a higher percentage of invasive procedures. And in the ischemia CKD trial, which was uh, for stable CKD patients, there was no difference really in outcomes for uh, patients with chronic kidney disease and with invasive and conservative arms. So you got two groups of people, people with ACS and CKD, who are not getting the, the ther therapeutic effects of revascularization versus those in, in, in CKD, which are stable, who really have no benefit from invasive versus conservative procedure. The other thing to know about is that in chronic kidney disease, you have associated issues with the heart and, and EDP is very important from this important study with hemodynamic guided hydration. It appears that, that you have to be cautious about EDP and not overhydrate these patients who are not in dialysis. A rising EDP above 15, you know, prehydration, giving lots of fluids can be hazardous to them, and they cannot really excrete out the excess volume, and they can go into pulmonary edema. So you have to be very careful about how you hydrate uh, individuals with CKD. So it's very important to have hydration protocols in your system. So standard hi hydration is uh, pre-procedures, normal saline, uh, 250 over two hours, and 100 minutes for about five hours. Then, uh, then 30 cc an hour to the procedure, generally in patients who are overnight. However, currently in our outpatient population, we hardly get this amount of volume in, but it'd be reasonable to at least in patients CKD to bring in them a little earlier and start giving this hydration at least four to six hours before the procedure. Low volume hydration is people with LV dysfunction who, who, uh, who can get normal saline 100 mils per hour and no hydration is generally patients with decompensated heart failure or end-stage disease dialysis. Uh, Etc. Post procedure, standard hydration is a uh, 250 now for four hours total of one liter. People have modified that depending on what contrast you use. More contrast is used, more hydration. But nowadays, if you can use a small amount of contrast, your hydration your hydration can be can can be less. Uh, so uh, next is low volume hydration and no IV hydration between with those with decompensated heart failure. What is the hydration protocol from the present study is normal saline at three mils per kilogram per hour during the procedure and four hours post procedure if the LVDP is 18. Normal or normal saline to one mils per kg per hour during the procedure and for four hours post procedure if you have a higher EDP. In our population here, we have a lot of patients with hypertension and end stage and end stage renal disease and we really are very cautious about how to hydrate these individuals. And of course, you don't give any hydration post procedure of the EDP is more than 24. What about contrast volume? Contrast volume is based on EGFR. Very simple. If your EGFR is 60 or something like that, you should not exceed that contrast use. Also, um, I'm going to interrupt. Bashir, would you mind telling the other hall that I'm running a little behind because they're texting me? Uh, I, I apologize for that. Uh, let me, let me answer the other hall and tell them still in the in hall B. Sorry. So contrast volume, very simple. If you, you get an EGFR off lab results, if your EGFR is set 45, you should not exceed that amount. If your EGFR is 60, you should not exceed that amount. In new systems, you should only use three to six cc of contrast injection by diagnostic study and three cc's for puffs and PCI. There should be no contrast puffing for catheter engagement. If you know where you are, the vessels, particularly the left coronary artery, you just inject 10 cc saline and you'll see some EKG changes on your monitor that'll tell you where, you're, where you are. And then you should remove, uh, when you remove catheters for exchanges, uh, you, should, uh, you should remove the contrast from the catheter before you do the exchanges so you know what exact amount of contrast you're using. 
For ventricle grams, generally, if you need to do that, generally, uh, you can get a good idea of the LV function from an echo. Uh, but you have to do that and use uh, half, half, half dilution with saline and inject only 20, 30 cc's with a PSI of 700. If uh, creatinine is 1.5 and contrast dose has been reached, you should defer PCI for elective cases. What about ultra low contrast? Ultra low contrast is volume of contrast administered if the EGFR ratio is less than one. Contrast induced nephropathy is increased in serum creatinine uh, greater than 25% compared to pre procedure within 48 to 72 hours of procedure, or increased in serum creatinine equal to or greater than 0 0.5 from the baseline. How do you do contrast optimization? You should do low magnification, no panning. You should obtain left coronary artery. Two views only, like a AP cord or a spider or a cranial view. Those are only two views you need, really. Uh, and inject three mils of contrast uh, for each view. In RCA, get an LAO cranial. So you can do good um, study. If you have a good good uh, camera in your system, a modern camera, you can visualize everything in, in less than 10 mLs. And that's all you need for diagnostic studies. Now, what about um, wiring uh, blindly? For example, if you've taken a set picture, like a single image, a reference image, uh, and you can know where your artery is. You can, if you're a good operator, be able to wire down the LED. This wire on the other side shows you that it tracks the LED and sort of after you've crossed the region, buckling is is okay. And you similarly can do the same thing for the diagonal branch. Uh, now, now in certain monitors now, for example, in the Philips system, uh, there's what is known as a dynamic roadmap. It creates a roadmap from your last reference. And when you pull it up on your pedal, this is what you see, then you can wire based on the roadmap. You don't have to inject any contrast. And I'll show you the example of case I just did, where, you know, uh, this is a reference roadmap, and I'm trying to wire it, and you can see I'm, my wire is going to first the diagonal, the lesion is more proximally, that's over there. Buckles the lesion, pull back the wire, and then I can migrate the wire, it goes to the septal over here, down to the distal LED. And that helps preserve contrast. Now, in certain systems like Philips, which have integrated systems, you can only get a reference over here. Then you can do other things based on this reference and the dynamic roadmap. For example, see you can push your a pressure wire. You can see where the difference or uh, where the stenosis really is. And then you can, for example, in this panel here, you can do co-registration without giving any more contrast. So you know the length of the lesion stented. And you can use IVUS to determine the reference vessel diameter or the plaque burden. And then you can size based on this co-registration without giving any more contrast. You can, you can stent. And then you can, after doing all that, you can take a final picture. So all these tools are available in newer integrated systems for your use. Finally, the other tools you can use, if you don't have that, you can use a, your, your, your dual 2E or, or or something like that, or use your, your normal 2E that you have. For example, in this case, you have a reference image here. You have a lesion here. You've got your, your operating wire down here. You can put a second wire or marker wire down. You know, remember from the tip, to, uh, to the pro the dark portions, always about three centimeters or so in most wires. You pass an IVUS down and know where your distal landing zone is and push your marker wire to that point and bring the ultrasound back and know your proximal reference zone. In this case, you know you're pretty close to the end of the of the marker wire. You can estimate that a 28 or 30 millimeter stent might work without giving you more contrast and do the final angiogram. So just a brief overview of CKD, uh, the issue of ACS and CKD patients not having adequate angiography where they have the most benefit versus stable CKD patients, which can be monitored conservatively, and tips and tricks about hydration and the low volume contrast to you. And I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tanvir Ram. Uh, great talk, excellent review um, for everything we need to know. I think uh, as an interventional cardiologist, um, somebody who already has CKD is always a concern and uh, excellent tips how to avoid and uh, decrease the amount of contrast to decrease the um, risk of worsening renal function.